Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Psalm 22 speaks about one who is in great suffering. And this one turns to God for assistance. And we know that God is faithful to overcome ultimately death and the enemy in order to restore all things to his will. The question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we going to be part of that restoration? And there's only one way possible, and that is through the acceptance of the gospel. God's plan of salvation. When one is saved, the work of the Holy Spirit will restore you to the things of God. And when I say the things of God, primarily I'm speaking about God's will. Well, with that said, let's open up our Bibles and look to Psalm 22, the book of Psalms and Psalm 22. Now, you recall that last week when we began this psalm, we saw that passage that speaks of Messiah upon the tree, crying out to his heavenly Father. And we've mentioned that this psalm is one of the psalms, and there are several, that we call messianic. In fact, this 22nd psalm has several verses that others spoke in regard to Yeshua or that he himself uttered. And therefore, we find great information from Psalm 22 about Messiah, but we need to remember something. It was written by David. It was written about him as he encountered hardships and persecution and the attacks of the enemy. So even though this Psalm has relevance for Yeshua, And him being on that cross also understand that there is great revelation, much truth in order to help us overcome the attacks of the enemy and do so walking in faithfulness, trusting in him, relying upon his help. So with that said, let's look where we left off last week, Psalm 22. And we're going to begin in verse 17 in the English, 18 in the Hebrew. And notice what is spoken of here. We read in this verse, I will count all my bones. And many people see this relating to the fact that when one is crucified, they are dehydrated. They perspire a great deal because of the pain, and perhaps a better word would be the agony that they are in, an agony that goes on and on and on. Many people who were crucified, they would live more than a day, sometimes two, three days, suffering intensely. Now, we know that Yeshua, he was crucified But he did not die by crucifixion. He died on a cross. But as I've said in other messages, and this psalm even relates it, and that is, remember, he cried out with a strong voice. Now, one of the ways that that people would die the most frequent way upon that cross through crucifixion is that they would suffocate. They would not have the strength in order to take a breath. But Messiah, he cried out in a loud voice, saying, it is finished, and then he gave up his spirit. Therefore, he did not suffocate, but we mentioned before in other teachings that he, this one who knew no sin, perfect without sin, 
The scripture says he became sin for us. Therefore, sin is synonymous with death, and he received the judgment of all of our sins, meaning your sins and my sins. So he died because of sin on the cross. He suffered greatly. He was in agony, but he died due to sin. The judgment of God was upon him again. He was innocent, perfect, never having sinned. It was your sin, my sins, the sins of humanity that the word of God tells us were placed upon him. So in the midst of this suffering, he mentions, I will count all of my bones. Likewise, it's mentioned that they, those who were at the cross, they will gaze and they will see me. And we know that there were witnesses, those who looked at him while he hung upon that tree. And people said different things concerning him. Now the next verse, they will divide my garments among themselves and concerning my clothes. Now they use two words, the word for lavush, what one wears and begged a garment or clothes concerning my clothes. They will cast lot. And this was fulfilled. We know that when we read the gospel accounts. So this is another example of this psalm relating to Messiah Yeshua and his work of redemption. And even though he died, we know, and this is a testimony for us, he was resurrected. God the Father raised him from the dead, and that gives us hope as well in the resurrection. And you, verse 19 in English, 20 in Hebrew, and you, O Lord, do not be far. Now, again, this is wonderful information where we realize, and this is what this verse is telling us, our dependence upon God. We want to be with him. And the way that we're with him is in the midst of his will. So Yeshua when we look at this psalm and we apply it to him, we get revelation. But we need to remember David is the author, and even though David was inspired by the Holy Spirit and wrote down these things that many of which, not all, but many apply to him, we need to see that the wisdom is in our receiving this truth and implementing it in our life, these principles. So you, O oh Lord, do not be far my strength and my help hasten. God is faithful. When we realize that he, and this is so foundational, it is a must that we take hold of that and believe it, that he is our strength and our help. Without him in our life, we have no hope. But when we, and we'll see this taught in a moment, when we are in the midst of a covenantal relationship. And when you enter into a covenantal relationship, and that covenant is the new covenant, it is an eternal covenant. What I say often is this, quoting the writer of Hebrews, if the blood of goats and bulls and calves and sheep had a positive outcome, that God recognized, looked upon that blood, and there was benefits from that blood in a person's life. The writer of Hebrews says, this being the case, how much more so the blood, the blood that was shed for you and me of the only begotten Son. So he is indeed our strength and our help. And the writer says, hasten, meaning he recognizes that without that strength, without that help from God, through a covenantal relationship, this one has no hope. He says, verse uh, 21 in Hebrew, 20 in, in English, save my soul from the sword. And this certainly would be so relevant those days when 
one of the most common ways to die in battle was at the, the sword, being killed by a sword. David was pursued by Saul. He was pursued by the enemies of Israel as well. So this was relevant in his life. Save my soul from the sword. And the second part, he writes about from the hand of a dog. Now, this word yad, obviously dogs, we would say that they have paws, not hands. But the word here is being used poetically. This is a psalm. Psalm has parallelism. It is a poem. And in this case, this word yad for hand speaks about authority. And several times in the scripture, we see how the word dog is used for one who has no sensitivity for the things of God. A dog, for example, does what he wants no matter who's watching, who's looking. He has no shame. He feels nothing from, from society. How people are looking, what they think, dogs don't concern themselves with that. They pursue their objective without thinking of other things. And he's saying here that he does not want to fall prey to those, to be under their authority, their power that has such a mindset. So we read, from the hand of a dog, he says, and it's his word for, many says precious, but it speaks about his individuality. This word is parallel to the word nafshi, my soul. And it speaks about the unit, and in this case, he's speaking about the very essence of who he is. David is saying here in this psalm that the very essence of who I am deliver me because David wants to do something. David is committed to the call that God has placed upon him. And what does he want to do? Well, look at the next verse. He continues to speak and he says, Save me from the mouth of a lion. And this is a word, if you read and study the psalm, and you watch the first part, we talked about the word arye and the word ari, both relating to lion, and this is the word arye. Save me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns. And this word, ramim, which probably speaks of like a bison, some type of, of large animal. He says, from the horns and horns refer not to just a threat, but it also speaks of strength and power. So he says, and from the horns of buffalo, you have answered me. Now, we probably haven't gone into this psalm in the deepness and the thoroughness that we should. But when you pay close attention, you see something. Throughout this psalm, especially in the latter half, what we're studying right now, we see that there goes back and forth between the second person singular, meaning you, and the word him or he, the third person singular. And it's as though David is addressing you, O God, and then speaks of him. And it's clear that he's speaking about the same one, but here's the beauty. We've said that this psalm is messianic. And it's as though he speaks to the Messiah in the third person, and then he speaks to God the Father in the second person. And this going back and forth between the second person singular and the third person singular says much about the unity between God the Father and God the Son. Look now to verse 23 in Hebrew 22 in English. I will tell your name to my brothers. Now, here again, the name. This is the name of God relating to, in this context, this psalm is messianic, the name of Messiah. And it's speaking here about, and I've mentioned, the call of David. We're all called to be people who testify, who reveal the truth of God. 
and it's, of course, his plan of salvation. So the author here, King David, is saying, I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Now, there would be no name, need for him to simply say the name of God. His brothers would know this. And it's speaking about Am Yisrael, the people of God. They knew that name. But this psalm is messianic. It may be emphasizing the responsibility that you and I have to share the name of Yeshua with others and to also praise him. As he says, I will praise you. Look now to verse 23 in English, 24 in Hebrew. The ones who fear the Lord, they will praise him. That's the key. In this simple phrase, how many words in the Hebrew text? Yirei Hashem Halaluhu, which means the ones who praise the, excuse me, the ones who fear the Lord, they praise Him. And it's really in the past which says they have a testimony. They have a history of praising God. Furthermore, all the seed of Jacob. Now, I'm going to go into this very briefly, but it is so unfortunate. And every time I mention what I'm going to share, I get numerous, probably the most emails and, and critical emails is what I'm going to say right now. And that is that the name Jacob, just think of the context here. We're looking, and the parallelism of a psalm is so important in helping us understand. We're equating here the ones who fear the Lord and the ones who are praising Him. It says, all the seed of Jacob. Now, Jacob does not mean a deceiver, but Jacob means one who pursues God, follows after God. And when you look here, those who follow after God sees priority in, in this, sees priority in God. That's what the fear of the Lord is about. So all the seed of Jacob, what will they do? They will honor him. And likewise, they will fear him, who? All the seed of Israel. In this verse, we're seeing what the Torah teaches us. And that is how the, the word zerah, seed in Hebrew, is so significant. We see it in regard to zerah, Avraham, the seed of Abraham, referring to Messiah, but also referring to the, the offspring in faith, the same faith of Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham. And this word seed relates to God's congregation, those who are connected with him by means of a covenant. So all the ones who are of Israel, they are going to fear, they're going to demonstrate reverence for God. Next verse, for he, referring to God, does not despise and does not abhor the suffering, the affliction of the afflicted. God is sensitive, and this is so vital in regard to David's life. David, think of this. The Lord's beloved, that's what David, that name means, the beloved of God. And David, in his faithfulness, now we know that there were times that, that David did not do entirely what God would have him to do. But, but David, as the scripture says, his heart, he had a lev nachon, a heart that was established, a heart that was towards God. He had a desire to serve God. And in David's obedience, his faithfulness, that all brought about great suffering in his life. And what does he say here? For he, meaning God, does not despise. He does not abhor the affliction of the afflicted one, nor does he hide his face from him. But when he cries out unto him, what does God do? 
It's that word shamea. Shamea here speaks about God hears, but not just hears. This word lishmoa always, always has intrinsically a response to hear and move, to hear and act. And this is what David is speaking about. And the reason why he knows this, of course, we could answer that question. He's under the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But, but putting that to the side for a moment, it's a very important thing. But David also is, is understanding this and able to testify of this because of his experience, his history with God. And that's why and this is foundational for each of us. That is why when we walk with God, God is going to demonstrate his faithfulness. And in demonstrating his faithfulness, it is going to be, be build in our life, in our minds, a testimony of God. Now, we're supposed to have a testimony, but as we have a testimony before God, God will testify in response. We will see his faithfulness, his fidelity to his word, to his promises. And that's what David is acknowledging here. So he writes that God, one who's in a covenant relationship with him, when that one is suffering, God does not uh, think little. He doesn't despise that. He doesn't abhor this suffering, meaning pays uh, no heed to it. He will not hide his face from such a one, but rather when he calls out unto him, it says, Shemaiah. He hears and he will respond. Verse 26 in Hebrew, 25 in English. Now, of all the verses to translate, this is probably the most difficult one in, in this verse or this, this psalm because it says, from you. And what it's referring to here is this, from you, out of my relationship with you, out of my experience, out of what I, I experience from the faithfulness of God. He says, from you is my praise. And notice he makes that praise where? In the congregation, and it's here, Kahal Rav, in the great congregation. And because of that, notice David, and this is so true, and it goes both ways. When we walk in faithfulness, when we are obedient, our obedience brings about an experience where we experience the faithfulness of God. Now, God is always faithful. And, and what I'm speaking here is this, God's always faithful. You obey, you're blessed. You disobey, you're cursed. So even in that judgment, that punishment, that discipline, the faithfulness of God is seen. But in this case, David is speaking out of it in a positive way. And what he's saying is, look again at this, from you, my experience with you, O God, I have praise. And I want to make that praise known where? in the congregation, the great congregation. And now David says, based upon God's actions in my life, he says, I want to respond in this by doing what? My vows I will pay before those who fear him. He's testifying. Those who give God a priority, those who say yes to God, David wants to say and be an encouragement and tell them about how God has acted in his life. This is what all of us should strive for. And God will always give us the ability to have that testimony. All we have to do is hear his word, seek his revelation in the scripture, apply it to our life, and we're going to experience God's testimony, God's faithfulness, God's presence in our life and that will give us the opportunity to share that and to to act in a committed way that's what it means here it's an idiom in this case nidarai ashalem my vows i will pay before the ones who fear him verse 27 in hebrew 26 in english anavim anavim here are the humble ones 
Now, this word humble recognizes. See, a person is humble. Just by nature, they will be when they recognize the greatness of God. If you deny God, if you reject God, if you doubt God, you don't know God according to a scripture, the lack of knowing God is going to produce pride, arrogance, a haughty spirit in someone. But the more that you understand God and his greatness, his glory, his majesty, when you see how great God is, it is going to produce humility. That fact is going to produce humility in your life. And when you're humble, God works. That's why it says, the humble, they will eat and they will be satisfied. Meaning that they will partake and, and what they receive from God is going to satisfy them and that's going to lead to them praising the Lord. And who's that? Dorshav. Dorshav means those who seek God. But there's two different words for this in the Hebrew language. There's a word, Mivakesh, a seeker. And there's a word, Doresh. And Doresh is a much stronger word. Now, we might use the English word, you know, I like to make a request of you. I like to ask you something. And then there's a word, demand. Now, obviously, we are never, we wouldn't be humble if we think we could demand something from God. That's not what the message is. The message that's contained in this word is this. It is to seek with great urgency. To seek because you recognize how significant this is. God's presence, God's power, God's help, and God working in my life. So that's why it says here, those who have sought God in this way, they will praise the Lord. Finally, end of this verse, your heart and when it says your heart, it's you in the plural. So, so David is testifying, your heart will live forever. And it can be an idiom. Heart sometimes relates to a thought. And the thoughts of God are eternal, meaning this. What God thinks is the reality. We look, for example, in several places that uses the word etzah, the council, oftentimes in the plural, etzot. And, and this word speaks about God's plans, his, his counsel. And we've talked about this word before, about how God's counsel of long ago becomes a reality. His plans will be. And in this case, what it's talking about here is that the thoughts of God within us, what God places within our, our thoughts from him, it will live, it will be. Verse, verse 28 in Hebrew, 27 in English. Now, I mentioned about a covenant a few minutes ago. And I always point out whenever this word, liskor, liskor is to remember. And when this word appears in the text, whether we're dealing with the Hebrew passage or in the Greek language from the New Covenant, the word to remember, he remember, whatever form it is, always it relates to a covenantal context. So when we look at this verse and it says, they will remember, what are they remembering? A covenant, God's covenant that he made with humanity. They will remember, and because of that covenant, the promises that are contained in this covenant, they will turn. They will turn to the Lord. And notice, this is beyond just Israel. It says, ko afse aretz, all the ends of the earth. Meaning God's covenantal promise, that Abrahamic covenant, that Messiah is foundation of, the gospel and the new covenant is related to, they are one issue. That is not just for one people, not just for the sons of, of Jacob, but it says, unto all the ends of the earth. And those that uh, remember and repent, that's what the word turn, turns to God because of this covenant. It says, 
they will worship before you. Who? Ko mishpachot goyim. All the families of the nations. Now, in the book of Genesis, in that Abrahamic covenant, we have ko mishpachot adama all the families of the, the, the earth, but it's a word for land or ground. Speaking about the fact that humanity was made out of Adama, the ground. That's why the first man is called Adam. He was made from Adama, so he was called Adam. Here, it's simply a reference to this psalm being messianic, relating to Yeshua and his work. This message of Yeshua. This plan, this purpose, this mind of God that Yeshua went out to fulfill doing the work of salvation so that we could experience what we talked about at the beginning, restoration. This is a message for all the families of the nations. doesn't matter what culture, what group, what race you are. This message is for you. For to the Lord is, and I love this word, what we see here, ha melucha the kingdom the kingdom belongs to him and everything that he's saying here in this 22nd psalm has kingdom implications it's when we put this truth into our life yes we're going to have a testimony yes we're going to experience the faithfulness of god and it's all going to bear witness to the reality of the king of the kingdom and the character of that kingdom it's going to be seen in our life. So he says, they will remember and they will turn to the Lord all the ends of the earth. They will bow down. It's a word of worship. They will fall prostrate is another way we could translate it before you, all the families of the nations. Unto the Lord is the kingdom. And he, in his word, Moshe, rules among the nations. Verse, verse 30 in Hebrew, 29 in English. They will eat and they will worship. Now, what are they going to eat? All the fatness. This is a word for the preferred, the goodness of, of the land. All who eat of the goodness. This is speaking about, it's an idiom for God's provision. When we talk about kol dishne eretz, all the fat, all the choice of the land. It speaks about God's goodness that he provides. And that is going to, when we partake, it's like taste the Lord and see that he's good. When we do that, it's going to lead to worship. Second part. Now, this is also not so hard to translate, but it's a, a word, a verse that, that can be difficult, this second part. Before him, they will bow all the ones who go down to the dust. And it speaks about humanity. It may be speaking about uh, uh, one's, one's mortality. When we recognize our mortality, we're going to turn to God. We are going to bow in his presence. His soul will not live. We need to realize in the word for nephesh here, nafsho, his soul in this word, it can relate to simply the physical life of someone. Many times, and this is why it's so important to pay attention to the biblical language, because it says in the book of Genesis, for example, God created man and he became a living being. What was that word for a living being? A nephesh. See, we need to make a distinction, grammatically, vocabulary, between the word nephesh and the word neshema. One speaks of soul, the other one's soul. But one is more in a physical sense, that we have right now physical life from the day we're born. And that physical life comes to an end. But the spiritual life of the neshema, not the nephesh, it continues on. Now, this relates to the Hebrew word, nephesh. We can't take that Greek word and apply that same things to it because it's a different language, different vocabulary, and different implications. So he says, everyone is mortal. 
His soul of everyone will, in fact, die. And we need to realize that. But, next verse, verse 30 in English, 31 in Hebrew. The seed, notice the difference. Yes, there's those who are mortal beings that have no hope. They will, will go down to dust. Their soul will die. But the seed, the seed, it says, will serve him. He will tell, that is related to that seed, and it's the word Zerah, like Zerah Avram, the seed of Abraham, those covenant people. It says, he will tell of the Lord to generation. Now, some will say to the next generation, it's not there. It's just the word Lador. It's not Lador Haba. Or some will say for generation after generations or in the plural. It's simply saying that he is going to tell that next generation, his children, he's going to prepare. And this is also a kingdom reference. Well, let's go to the last verse, verse 31 in English, verse 32 in Hebrew. They will come and they will declare. And what are they going to declare? What should be an interest to you? Notice what it says. His righteousness. Now, that word righteousness is related to the kingdom. It is a kingdom. Just listen to what the prophets say. His kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness. It reflects his judgments, his laws, his statutes, his commandments. So we see in the ending verse, they will come and they will declare his righteousness to a people that was born. Now, it's very important that you pay attention to the grammar here. Because many will, will mistranslate this based upon assumptions, based upon perhaps the views of other verses. But if we pay close attention to it, it says, last, last few verses, last four words in Hebrew of the text, le'am nolad ki asa. And this word, nolad, has to do with one who has been born and it's not just speaking about the fact that he was born, but he was made to be born. In other words, this idea of being born, an act happened that gave life. And in essence, we're speaking about this second birth that comes through faith in the grace of God that are all wrapped up in his covenantal promises, what his covenant produces when we enter into a covenantal relationship with him. When God, and here's the key, when God obligates himself to people because of this covenant. So we read, to a people that uh, uh, are born, and he's the reason that they are born, because ki asa, for he has done. He has given this life. He has given this birth. And let me close with this. Earlier this week, I was teaching from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. And there it speaks about the, the regeneration. And this regeneration, we hear it oftentimes and we think usually of individual regeneration, being born again, becoming that new creation, and that's fine. But, but in actuality, when that word is used in the book of Matthew, it speaks about regeneration in one sense, in that context. And that is the Son of Man, Messiah Yeshua, setting upon the throne of God and bringing about the righteousness of his kingdom, that it will be experience. And I close with this for a reason, because this psalm speaks of Messiah on the cross. Now we know why he did that. He died upon that cross so that individuals could be born again, be part of a covenant, a new covenant, which is related to that gospel message, that we could be partakers of the promises of God, that we could eat, so to speak, the goodness, the fat of the land. 
And all of being a recipient of God's work in our life is going to produce us bowing before him, prostrating ourselves before him for the purpose of worship. And that is going to propel us into a kingdom experience. We can have a foretaste now in this age, but this is our true destiny. To be part of a kingdom, and I'll close with this, a kingdom of righteousness. See, why David suffered, why he pursued the things of God, is that David was committed to righteousness. And the reason why the son of David, Messiah Yeshua, why he went to the cross, was ordered that a righteous kingdom could be experienced by those who would call upon his name. And when we look at Psalm 22, we find much revelation concerning the person, that is the identity, and the work of Messiah Yeshua, this one who is the Son of God, God with us, known as Emmanuel. Well, we'll stop with that until next week, and we have a very special presentation of Psalm 23. Until then, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.